there was a motto um, advertisement a couple of years back, maybe you remember this, for Outback Steakhouse, where the, the idea was no rules, just right. Um, I don't know if I can really say that like with a Australian accent. You gotta like run up to like shrimp on the bobby, no rules, just right. That was better than I thought it'd be. I'm not quite sure like what exactly they were going for. I don't know if it's because, you know, it's way out in Australia and you can do whatever you want like in the country or like that idea that Australia was like formed by convicts. Have you heard that? I don't know if it's even true or not. But like it's this like wild west Australia and the same is true at Outback Steakhouse. When you come, there's no rules here. Whatever you want. If you want to put ketchup on your steak or whatever you want, there's no rules. Whatever you want is right. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if like you still go to Outback. That, that slogan has worked on you, but I, I decided to uh, use that for our title this morning as we close up the book of Judges. We're going to go through the end. Uh, there's, there's five chapters to this. And you may be thinking, whew, I am ready for Judges to end. I, I'll be honest, I'm a little ready for Judges to end because this whole book, if you haven't been a part of this this time, it is, it's, it's hard because it's just a, a story, it's true history about terrible people and awful things happening and, and, and the, the, the narrator, author of the story rarely comes in and says, this was good or this was bad. Sometimes, sometimes God is involved, sometimes he's not. And we're just kind of left with this, okay, who do I emulate? What, what do I do? Now, no rules. Just right. This, this may sound great to some of you. Uh, I think to like a child, to like a four-year-old, that sounds amazing, right? I can do whatever I want. There's no rules. Whatever I say goes. They, that's what they believe. But I think if you really think about that, some sort of society that has no rules whatsoever, like, like a Mad Max society, like some sort of dystopian, futuristic, like, you know, we, we, we need rules and laws and good rules and laws to make things safe, well run. In the book of Judges, we find ourselves um, in the promised land. God has told his people for many, many years, I'm going to bless you, make you uh, a multitude, make you a blessing to be a blessing. And then he finally puts them in the promised land. They've been slaves in Egypt for a long time, didn't have their own land. He saves them miraculously. They wander the desert for 40 years. They're finally in the promised land, but they don't follow God's instructions. And there are other idolatrous, sinful people around them in the promised land that, that tempts them and um, continues to assault them, uh, lead them away from God. And so they continue to be in this cycle we've seen in Judges of turning toward idolatry, turning against God, uh, God saying, that's what you want? Okay, I'll give you over to those people, and, and they're oppressed for 5, 10, 40 years, and then they cry out, God, help us, and God sends some sort of Savior, Deliverer. Now, they're going into a time where they're going to have these kings, King David, um, Saul, all these kings that will rule over them. But throughout these last five chapters, we're going to hear this same verse over and over again, preparing us for this idea of the king is coming, somebody to take ownership is coming. Chapter 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. There were no rules. There was nobody with authority Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Chapter 18, verse 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. 
Chapter 19, verse 1. In those days there was no king in Israel. And then the whole book ends, this very last verse, chapter 21, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. No rules. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Sounds glorious, right? It reminds me of uh, the, the movie The Lion King. There's the, the scene where Scar is uh, talking with his, his, his minions, the hyenas, and he's telling them that his plan is how he's going to kill Mufasa the king. And the hyenas are excited. They say, you know, no king. They start singing, no king, no king, la, 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 la. And they think it's going to be wonderful. Of course, Scar wants to be king himself. But, And we've seen all throughout this whole book of these different themes of like passing on the faith and these, these leaders and the importance of our words and this cycle and God saving and these great, not so great people like Samson or, or Deborah, Gideon. Well, these last five chapters, they, they kind of break the mold a little bit. There's no longer a cycle. There's no longer a great judge. There's not even really people named. There's a couple people that seem like, oh, there's going to be a great leader here, but no. Um, it's just going to show us how terrible life was without any kind of king or authority. And I think it's still true for our own life. If we were to just throw out authority, and really what I'm saying more is God's authority, throw out any kind of say that God has in our own life or in major rules or laws in the world, what would life be like? It's almost like that we're going to see in this book, it's like people who are, are, are just kind of stepping up and saying, I am the craziest one, I'm the worst. And the next person comes and says, no, 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 you have it all wrong. I am the crazier one. Like there's that phrase, I don't know, like hold my beer. Like you know, you're going to like do something crazy next. Like this is what's happening. You're going to see like this. I say that jokingly because this last five chapters is really hard. <laughs> there's some awful things that we're going to read about. And we just have to realize it's as if God is saying to them at this point, this is what you want. This is what you're going to get and see what it is like. So the question we're going to come back to is, do we live under God's authority? Do we want to? <laughs> These people do not. Um, you know, when it's, when it's the Wild West or Outback Steakhouse and anything goes and there's nobody in charge, no God, uh, this is going to describe what your life could be like here. It's almost like an apologetic this morning for if you don't want God in your life, here's what it might be like. So turn with me to chapter 17. We're not going to read all of these chapters. It's a lot. We'll kind of jump around a little bit and I'll summarize. But let's start with chapter 17 and see how this begins. <clears throat> there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, blessed be my son by the Lord. So right away, we have kind of a family dynamic here. We've got a mother. We've got a son. Son stole from the mother. Uh, and then he says, yep, I'm the one that took it. She's mad at first, but then she's blessing him. Verse 3, and he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord. It's a good thing, right? For my hand, for my son, to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine. And he made an ephod and household gods and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. Here's our verse. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So let's, let's pause there in this chapter. Number one, without God's authority, 
our religion is rotten. Now, I mean religion in the best uh, and maybe worst sense. I mean religion in our relationship with God, in our spirituality. Um, but when it turns into anything the way God wants it, it turns into a religion wrote, do things to please God. And as we begin to see in these first few verses, uh, it is all kinds of mixed up and crazy. Right? She, she's going to dedicate something to the Lord of, of this thing that was stolen, and I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord, and then, and then she makes some, some idols and carved images and gives it to her son. He makes a little shrine for himself of household gods, and then he takes one of his own kids. His son is like, I think you should be my priest. And that's what happens. Let's read on to verse 7. Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judea of the family of Judah who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah so to sojourn where he could find a place. And he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? And he said, well, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. Now, Levites are supposed to stay in their place, stay in Bethlehem, do ministry to the Lord where they're at. So this guy is not what he's doing. Micah says to him in verse 10, stay with me. Be to me a father and priest. I'll give you 10 pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and you're living. And the Levite went in and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite and the young man became his priest and it was in the house of Micah. Like, I don't know what happened to his son. He just kicks his son out like, hey, there's a new guy here. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. It's like you could almost take that last verse if you just pull it out of there and be like, oh, man, this guy is so right and holy. Like, yeah, God is going to prosper him because he has like a holy person to live with him. But what he's doing is he's just kind of Taking what he likes, mm, I, like, I like having a priest in my house. Oh, I like having like some household gods that I don't have to like travel anywhere or do what God wants me to do. But I'll just kind of make up my own little religion here. And um, oh, you're going to, okay, you put here, I'm going to like you over here. Like I don't really care what God thinks, but I'm just going to make up my own little thing. And yes, God is going to bless me. <laughs> there was uh, an actor that I heard of that, Whenever they would stay in a hotel, you know, there's Gideon Bibles and hotels, uh, they would purposely go into the hotel room, the Bible, and look for pages and verses that they did not like in the Bible and to rip those out. Um, you know, I don't like this, this thing over here about uh, this, or, or ooh, this one's too hard, I'm going to rip this thing out. It's kind of what this guy is doing here. He's saying, I like this part of you, God. I don't like this part of you, so I'm just going to choose whatever I want to do. There's no, no rules here, whatever I say, okay? And the truth is that he is totally wrong with his last statement. God is not in the business of just blessing people for whatever they want to do, whatever kind of religion they want to take, or whatever kind of like, eh, it feels like maybe this is Jesus or God. Or, or kind of saying like, God, this is what I'm doing. You better bless me for it. Ugh. Well, it goes on then in chapter 18. There's kind of two stories. And 17, 18 go together and then 19 through 21. But we continue this story of this Levite and Micah a little bit into chapter 18. Where, where it just kind of gets even more murky where... We see without God's authority, there, there's really no moral absolutes. There's just nobody there to say, this is right, this is wrong. There's just nobody. Again, look at verse 1 of chapter 18. Here's our, our line. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, a tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So this people, the, the, the people of Dan, they, they 
are trying to find a place to settle down to live. And they come across Micah's house as they're traveling. Um, and they come across this Levite who is, who is a priest. He's acting as the priest of this one guy's house. And they talk to him in verse 4. Uh, well, the priest says to them, the Levite, and he said to them, this is how Micah dealt with me. He's hired me and I become his priest. And they said to him, well, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether our journey on which we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. So they found this priest that's not supposed to be there. They found this kind of household kind of religion thing. And they're like, oh, okay, well, sure, we'll take you as um, your word. And could you pray for us, kind of figure this out? And sure, okay, great. Okay, and they go on their way. Um, they get their whole army. They come back then to Micah's house and look in verse 17 what they do. And the five men who had gone out to scout the land went out and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, the, the priest said to them, what, what are you doing? This Levite's confused. Well, I, I work here. These are my metal images and things that I worship and help out. And they said to him, keep quiet. Put your hand in your mouth and come with us. Be to us a father and a priest. It's better for you to be a priest to the house of one man or to be a priest to a tribe and a clan in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and carved image and went along with the people. At first he's like, well, what are you doing? This is where I work. This is my place of business. This is my religious setup. And then they say, hey, we can make you, uh, you know, like a local celebrity. Make you richer even. You can have your, all your whole clan to be a priest over. So they just take, they go. Micah soon realizes this. He runs after them to try and stop them. Like, you've stolen my priest. You've stolen all the things that I've done. And they basically tell him, like, hey, you snooze, you lose. We're, we're bigger than you. What are you going to do? And then the Danites go take the rest of the land where they're set up, and they set up their new priest. And look at verse 30 then. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe, the Danites, until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. You have these little hints here in these two verses that this Levite was actually like a great, great, great grandson of Moses. He's related to Moses. And it's like talking about the house of God at Shiloh, the true place where you're supposed to go and worship. But they had this other little cult thing over here. There's just, there's nobody in this text that says, maybe it's wrong to steal. Well, maybe it's wrong to have our own household gods. Maybe we should do what God wants us to do. In, there's just nobody. There's nothing in here. And I truly believe that without, without God, th there's just no reference for any kind of morals or, or moral absolutes in, in the world. It's, it's really, it's, it's an interesting kind of defense apologetic for Christianity to think about, like, where do our rules and laws, things that we say are right and wrong, come from? Uh, I remember talking to a guy when I was in Colorado, kind of on this same point, and he, he was utterly convinced that if you just were to, like, go into a time machine, like, thousands, thousands upon years ago, somebody randomly decided morals. They randomly decided, okay, it's wrong to kill people. Um, it's, it's wrong to do these certain things. And then that just kind of caught on and caught on and passed on and passed on. Just some random dude. Um, and then if we want to like make up some new rules, like it's, you know, it's, it's good to torture children, we can just decide that. Or as a society, we could do that. That's, that's kind of where you go. If there's no moral lawgiver or God to tell us 
what is right and wrong. It's kind of like if we all decide as a group here that uh, this new rule, this new thing is good, then that's what makes it true because the majority of us want that. No, that's, that's not true. That's not how you do this. Without God to give us insight into rules, laws, how to govern ourselves, morals, it just turns into this chaos of, well, I guess whatever we want can happen. <sighs> okay, it's going to get worse. Yeah. Chapter 19. We now turn to a new story um, about this tribe of the Benjamites. Um, Chapter 19, I'll just read a little bit of first here, verse 1. In those days, there was no king in Israel. A certain Levite was journeying in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. This is not the same Levite. And his concubine was unfaithful to him. And she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there some four months, then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. So point three here is without God's authority, marriage and sexuality are messed up. Um, we have a Levite again, supposed to be kind of a uh, religious, holy person. Um, you know, think of him kind of as a, a pastor in some ways, that they're to kind of represent God, to offer sacrifices, all of these things. He has a concubine. He's got a, a, a woman on the side who it's like she's a concubine, but also talk about as a wife, some sort of mixed up whatever this marriage is here. Uh, she is unfaithful to him. She runs away, goes back to her father's house, and it says that he goes there to speak kindly to her, but never talks to her the entire time. In fact, he's going to treat her like garbage. And the, the dad is the strangely like joyful to, to meet his daughter's who's a concubine, I don't know, it's just a weird father relationship, and he, he wants him to stay and keeps asking him to stay and do these things. M marriage it, by itself is tough. <laughs> marriage is not easy. I think when you take God out of the picture, you take God's authority out of the picture, it makes marriage even harder. I'm, I'm doing some pre-marriage counseling right now, and I often talk with uh, couples the importance of just praying together, which can be so hard, even that simple thing, whether it's before bed or at meals or whatever, it's just to pray together. Well, this Levite finally leaves uh, with his concubine wife, whatever she is, and he's traveling, and he says, well, it's getting late, um, let's, let's not stop at this town but hey, here's a Benjamite town, like some of the Israelites. Let's stop there and stay. And nobody lets them into a building, so they have to stay outside. And then an old man kind of passes by and says, hey, um, you, you don't want to stay outside here. Come into my place. So he, uh, the old man brings the Levite in with this woman. So look with me at verse 22 of chapter 19. This is where it's going to get awful. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating out the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. This is a nice, polite Bible way of saying there's something more than just knowing happening. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Behold, here, my, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. 
Maybe let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine, made her go out to them, and they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. As the dawn began to break, they let her go, and as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. There's so many things in the Bible that I just sometimes wish weren't there. I, I wish something like that was not there. If you ever have thought in the past that, like, the Bible is just about perfect people, you've got a messed up town of craze that calls them worthless fellows who want to take the man to violate and abuse him. You've got this person who lives in this town who's offering up his virgin daughter to be abused. And then this Levite says, no, I'll just kick out my concubine and wife. And then the people just abuse her all night. It's a no rules, just right kind of society. And then verse 27. And her master rose up in the morning, and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let us be going. It's very compassionate. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey, and the man rose up and went away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife. Taking hold of this concubine, he divided her limb by limb into twelve pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak. I mean, even just like personhood, the, this woman herself and her being is violated after she is dead. But just this is the idea in this whole society where there's no king, no, no God's authority. And I, I think we even see it here today when you look at things like, like I mentioned this last week, this billion, trillion dollar industry of pornography, or you look at, you know, adultery, or, you know, as I talked about this last fall, as we went to the book of Genesis, that we believe as, as Christians that God has given authority on gender, on marriage, that it's one man, one woman, biological, uh, to be married, no sex outside of marriage. And I mean, these things now that our society has, like transgender and all of this, that takes God's authority out and says, God, I don't care what you think, but I care what I think and feel. Well, in chapter 20, all of the, the people respond. All the Israelites come. They get this message from this guy, and they come to seek war. They're mad now, finally. Something, something has clued them that this is bad. Uh, something in their depraved morality that says, okay, this needs to stop. Something needs to happen. But as we're going to see, without God's authority, number four, there will be blood. All of Israel goes and makes war against the Benjamites. They respond. The Levite kind of tells his story again. And they go out now to try and kill all of the Benjamites. Chapter 20, verse 11. So all the men of Israel gathered against the city, united as one man. Which, I mean, that seems good. But, and the tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What evil is this that has taken place among you? Now, therefore, give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. They try and give them an out, not go over to war. And so then three times, actually, the, the whole group of Israelites, they go and seek the Lord. And this is the one time in all these five chapters that God comes up. Verse 18, the people of Israel arose and went up to Bethel and inquired of God, what 
Who shall go up first for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. It's the exact same question they asked God at the very beginning of this whole book. Who will go? Who will lead us? And God says the same answer, Judah shall go. It's almost like he's just saying, this is what you want. This is what you're going to get. Well, they go and they are destroyed. They're, they're defeated. And they go up again to God. And they, in verse 23, And the people of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until the evening. And they inquired the Lord, Shall we again draw near to fight against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Go up against them. Again, this is what you want. Go for it. And then they go out, they're defeated again, and again they go to God and say in verse 26, Then all the people of Israel, the whole army, went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted the day until evening and offered burnt offering and peace offering to the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days, and Phineas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministered before in those days, saying, Shall we go out once more to battle against our brothers, the people of Benjamin? Or shall we cease? <laughs> it's almost like they don't want to. Like, do we, are we going to do this again? The Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. It tells you each time how many people are killed. The first time, 22,000 Israelites are killed. Second time, 18,000 Israelites are killed. The third time they go up, 25,100 Benjamites are killed, plus then 600 more are killed. It's just this awful bloodbath of fighting and war between them that goes back and forth. And there have been terrible things done in the name of Christ over the years, right? There's been the, the crusades or, or those kind of bloodbaths. There have been plenty of times, too, when people have gone to war or killed because they don't want God in their life. I think Hitler and World War II are a great example of that, or someone taking ideology and saying, without God, it leads to this idea that there's a better race, an evolutionary race, maybe, that we can uh, create and be better from, to put down people like the Jews, without God and his authority, that's what it leads to. And then, like I said earlier, like, you know, it's this whole weird thing of everybody's like, you think you're crazy? Well, let's do something even crazier and worse and terrible. And this is how the whole chapter ends in verse 21. I'm sorry, chapter 21 of this book. They have this, like, Something in their conscience that says they did something bad. Now that something has happened. Chapter 21. Now the men of Israel had sworn at Mizpah, no one of us shall give his daughters in marriage to Benjamin. And the people came to Bethel and sat there till evening before God. They lift up their voices and wept bitterly. And they said, oh Lord, the God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel? That today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel. I just imagine God like, you're surprised? Like, I've been telling you. <laughs> and the next day, the people of Israel rose early and built there an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the people of Israel said, which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up in the assembly to the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord to Mizpah, saying, he shall surely be put to death. The people of Israel had compassion for Benjamin, the ones they just killed. Their brother and said, our tribe is cut off from Israel this day. What shall we do for the wives of those who are left? Since we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them any of our daughters for wives. And they said, well, well what one of the, the tribes of Israel did not come up to the Lord with us? And behold, no one had come up to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. So they think, well, maybe because this, this group didn't come, we should punish them. Verse 10, so the congregation sent 12,000 of their bravest men there and commanded them, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, also the women and the little ones. This is what you shall do. Every male and every woman that has lain with a male you shall devote to destruction. 
And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man by lying with him. And they brought them to the camp of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Then the whole congregation sent word to the people of Benjamin, who were at the rock of Rimmon, and proclaimed peace to them. And Benjamin returned to that time, and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive, the women of Jabesh Gilead, and they were not enough for them. And the story goes on that they, they go to another place and they steal more women for these men that they had just killed. Right, number five, without God's authority, the vulnerable will be exploited. This is how the book of Judges ends. It just gets worse and worse and crazier and crazier. And it ends in this same line, verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The Bible talks repeatedly about taking care of the poor, uh, looking out for the marginalized, standing up to the arrogant, the proud, making friends with the outcast. Uh, next week, we're, we're going to start a, a new sermon series, and <laughs> it's been my feeling of reading through this book of depravity just to run to Jesus. <laughs> and so we're going to go to Jesus next week as we talk about the, the week before Jesus' death. Some of the things that he did, like turning over tables, washing disciples' feet, just look at Jesus. Because I just can't help when I read the book of Judges and read this over and over again, this idea of everyone does what's right in their own eyes and it's just terrible and it's just sinful and awful that I need Jesus. I need God's authority in my life to just come to me and save me, a terrible sinner, and say, I will take over now. God's saying that and saying, you can't do this on your own. So my question for you guys today as I close up here is this. Are you living under God's authority? Is Jesus truly your king? Or is your own life just like this last verse that's just whatever you want in your own eyes? Do you, do you take this, do you absorb this and read this and think about it, apply it to yourself thinking, God, this is, you, this is your word, your authority. It speaks to me and says things to me that I should do and now I'm going to change because of it. Because when we put it away and just say, God, I'm going to kind of uh, do this over here. I don't want to listen to you. I'm going to make my own little images and idols and things. It does not go well and it snowballs. <laughs> if you've never known Jesus truly and your life is a wreck and a mess, I pray that you would come to Jesus today you would put your trust fully in him. It's believing there's a God, believing that he has things to say to us in the Bible and that he sent Jesus to us and that if we repent and believe, we can be saved. If that's you, pray with me now. Father, we, we come to you. I don't know. I just feel disgusted and hurt by, by these chapters, to, to think of these real people that were hurt so terribly by other people, abused, uh, killed. Father, you, you have a love for each and every individual, every person, and our own sinfulness, our own desires, they wreck us so terribly, wreck our, our relationships, our, our marriages, our our, our friendships, I mean, everything around us, God, is just wrecked by sin. And there's nothing we can do but cry out to you and say, God, would you come over and would you rule in my life? Would you truly be my king? Kick out everything inside of me that is uh, sinful and desiring other things and just take over in my own life, God. God, we just, we want to believe and see you. And so... We put our trust in you now, not tomorrow, 
Not next month, not, not when it gets harder, but now, God, to say, I believe in you, and I want you to be authoritative in my life. I want you, Jesus. I want you to wash me clean of my sins. God, I want you to forgive me. I thank you for what you've done through Jesus and the cross and the resurrection and that we can come to know you and that you can say that you love us. Father, as we sing this last song, as we talk about, we sing about running to you, would you assist our weary hearts to do that? God, we praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.